that we have uh, reporters and elected officials uh, in their presentations. They they go ahead and do charts. Um, it's really fun to see like you select your state or your city and then you select your data point and then your years. And then you and then there's a button called generate a chart. And the first time I did it, I was like, what? <laughs> online on, yeah, it was like um, online on demand. Um, so uh, we, we created it for um, for people to um, to be able to compare our data because some people are like well your data is very limited just to the financial stuff and we were like well do you want us you know we're not going to add a whole bunch of other data to it so we um, started data-z.org for um, the uh, to add context to our data so um, well I think our audience has joined us uh, welcome to our truth and accounting X ask the experts Today's topic is ethics reform in Illinois. Illinois is in desperate need of more transparency, but how did we get there? My name is Sheila Weinberg and I'm the founder and CEO of Truth in Accounting. We're a 501c3 think tank. As a nonprofit, we're always looking for other partners and supporters interested in our work. So feel free to reach out to us after um, the webinar if you have any questions or wanna join us in our efforts. Um, as a nonprofit, uh, uh, the reason I started uh, Truth in Accounting was because I realized that first at the federal level, then the state level and the city level, that the citizens really were not being provided the financial information they need to be knowledgeable participants in their governments. So I started Truth in Accounting. Um, you can find out more about um, us at truthinaccounting.org. Um, and uh, you can go, if you scroll down um, to the bottom of the website, oh, you can sign up for our daily newsletter called Morning Call. It'll come from our research director, Bill Bergman. And he aggregates uh, all the federal, state, and local government budgeting and accounting stories. It's a great email to get. Um, during this quarantine, I know that you might be looking for some fun. Um, so you can jump over to our sister website, data-z.org, and create your own charts. We have an unlimited number of charts, so more than 700 data points um, for the states and the 75 most populated cities and the governments. And once you create your own chart, you can print it or share it with others, create a JPEG. Um, I really urge you to do that. Uh, today's event is based upon the ethics reform work of the state and local government subcommittee of the Union League Club of Chicago's Public Affairs Committee and a Crane's article titled Springfield Tries Again on Ethics Reform, in which our expert today was featured. Joining me today is State Senator Heather Staines. Senator Staines has represented Illinois' seventh district in the Senate since 2008. She chairs the Appropriations I and Medicaid Managed Care Oversight Committees and serves on the Appropriations II Executive, Executive Appointments, Environmental and Conservation, Governmental Accountabilities and Pensions, and Human Services Committee. That's a lot of committees. Oh my goodness, she must be busy down there. <laughs> um, she has um, passed legislation on many issues, including marriage equality, uh, Medicaid, and more. Um, also joining us as another expert is our, as I mentioned, our research director, Bill Bergman. Uh, he delivers our morning call and also teaches uh, finance at the uh, courses at Loyola University of Chicago. Bill will be relaying your questions. So if you have a question for the Senator, please feel free to enter that. Uh, you won't enter it in the chat area, enter it in the Q&A at the bottom of your uh, Zoom uh, menu. Uh, if you hover over the bottom on the lower left-hand side, you'll see the Q&A button. Just type in your questions in the box at any point during the webinar and we'll try to get to answer it. Um, if we have a lot of people attending, if we don't get to your question, um, feel free to reach out to us after the webinar and we'll get an answer for you. Um, so um, I want to thank everybody for joining us and I'll turn it over to the Senator who has a brief presentation and then we'll turn it over to questions and answers and, uh, and go ahead, Senator. Thanks again for joining us. Perfect. Well, thanks for having me. I'm going to start um, 
getting to my screen share um, first. Uh, there we go. Hopefully it'll be coming up in a minute. There we go. Great. Um, and I am going, sorry, it's on the wrong one. Let me just get it back. I thought I got it at the beginning. So here we go. I, um, you know, right before we got on, while we were sort of all setting up, Bill Bergman shared with me that uh, there's polling that's done, we all know that from Gallup, about trust in government, and that Illinois is in fact at the bottom of all the states uh, on how uh, there's so much distrust in government here. And I, I certainly think we've been seeing that play out in elections, not just nationally, but here. And I, you know, I think a lot of our ethics challenges are really at the core of what's been going on um, with uh, the lack of trust in government here. Um, I'll do, I, I'm gonna try to just, I only have a few slides. I'll, I'll try to be quick on this and hopefully get to more Q and A time. But, um, you know, we have the, the um, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna go to the, uh, this version. I'll do a little bit of background on how we sort of got to where we are. There's been a lot of challenges on ethics uh, over the past decades here in Illinois. Um, some of what the current efforts are around ethics reform, and then I'll talk briefly about what some of the next steps might be from my take. Uh, this, it's always a challenge when we talk about doing ethics reform in Springfield. It's, it's, it's complicated and hard to actually make real progress, um, but we have done some stuff over the years. Um, you know, I'm, I'm only gonna go back as far as the Blagojevich era. We saw a lot happening under that, really that had to do with a lot of procurement issues, where you saw a lot of things happening through contracting and uh, people would get contracts if there was exchanges, um, those kinds of concerns. Um, post Blagojevich, we did do a big procurement reform. Um, and again, you know, I think we try to, and I use this, we, we try to deal with a very specific issue, but it really doesn't deal with the overall culture in Springfield. So in procurement right now, we have made it very complicated. Um, we have different la layers now in the procurement process to sort of put checks and balances on it. So it is, I think, hard for somebody in administration to benefit personally from a procurement, um, but we haven't really done anything to change the culture of Springfield. Uh, I think one of the things we see happen is if there's an issue, we try to very narrowly focus in on that, say we've done something and move on. Um, we also saw that then with sexual harassment. We've seen a number, you know, post the Me Too, there were some issues and challenges that came forward on some things that were happening in the House some of my colleagues, both in the House and the Senate, there were accusations around it. Uh, one of my colleagues, Melinda Bush, did a, a, a lot of work then on what kind of changes should we make to address um, the environment around sexual harassment. And in fact, we did make some changes there um, to the Legislative Inspector General uh, right now in Illinois, can initiate investigations uh, on his or her own for sexual harassment but only for sexual harassment issues. They're still not allowed to initiate investigations without getting approval by the legislative inspector general for anything else. So, you know, again, the only way we get things passed are very narrowly tailored to address a specific issue. Um, we've also then seen some of the legislative inspector generals really come out and talking about some of the, the challenges they have in sort of broadly addressing things because they don't have subpoena power they don't have the ability to initiate an investigation, and they do not have the ability to even issue a report without it getting the approval of the Legislative Ethics Commission, which is comprised of only legislators. Uh, two legislators from each of the four caucuses make up that commission. And we've seen them speak a lot about uh, the challenges they have in managing under that circumstance. Um, clearly, we've been seeing under the last uh, year or two a number of investigation indictments from my colleagues. We've had this happen in both the Senate and the House uh, for a number of things. And now obviously the Commonwealth Ed Edison investigation where there's a lot of concerns around favors that Commonwealth Edison as a very regulated utility has gotten in exchange for getting led, you know, things that they've given uh, in exchange for getting legislation helpful that's passed to them. These are all allegations at this point. We haven't had any um, uh, any findings, although one person sort of made some acknowledgments from ComEd, um, we haven't had any legislators specifically yet um, indicted under this, but I don't think that that investigation's done. Um, you know, so, and, and it just, you know, we go back further in Illinois history, there'll be more things to talk about. It's um, been an ongoing concern, and again, we tailor things very specifically to a very specific issue. Um, 
you know, I, I'm ho you'd like to believe that the environment now and real distrust, and we've seen this playing out in the elections that just passed. I know there's been a lot of discussion on um, what are the leadership of the Democratic Party here uh, may have been implicated in challenges to some races, um, that maybe there's an environment now that will lead to actually the ability to get some reforms done. Um, we had set up, we passed jointly, it was bipartisan, I think unanimous vote to set up a joint commission on ethics reform. Uh, they were, before the pandemic hit, were starting to hold their hearings. They continue to do so post the pandemic. Uh, they're supposed to come out with their report. Um, and, you know, that has not happened. It was supposed to come out by March 31st of this year. Uh, with the pandemic, that did not happen, but they have still yet to issue it. Um, which I do think at this point is concerning that we aren't seeing that. Um, I, I don't think they're meeting at this point. Uh, so it's unclear why we can't get sort of a report with recommendations out from, from that joint commission. There's a number of government reform groups, obviously truth and accounting, but you have reform for Illinois, the Better Government Association, Change Illinois are, are some of the better known ones that have all been calling for a lot of reform efforts right now too in this environment. I do think we're gonna have a moment of time in which we can hopefully pass one bill. Um, that's usually how it works. So the quality of that bill is gonna be highly important. Uh, and then there's been some different legislative proposals. Um, there's uh, been some Republicans that have come out with one. I, with some of my colleagues, uh, Andy Menard, Melinda Bush, Kelly Cassidy, Bob Morgan, and then a number of other folks, there were 16 of us in total Democrats, came out with a number of proposals, which is what I will speak about right now. And then I will talk a little bit about from what our proposals are, what's missing from what some of the other government reform groups have also um, been asking for. I think there's no disagreement in the nine items that we have, generally speaking. I think most uh, of the reform groups uh, support it. I think there may be some things that they would also like to add. And I'll talk about what might be missing on our proposals and, and why as well. And then really talk, just uh, you know, see what kind of questions you guys have. So our, we had nine proposals, uh, what the 16 of us sort of put forth in, in a press conference uh, earlier in the summer. And our goal was try to get these proposals included in the Joint Commission's report, uh, which as I say, we haven't seen that report yet. We divide our nine proposals into three different areas. Uh, first, um, lobbying reforms. And these kinds of things have come from significantly from what we've been seeing happening uh, in, you know, over the course of time. Uh, right, you know, we've seen a lot of what my colleagues have been getting investigated uh, into some of their actions has been around lobbying other units of government. The red light cameras, for example, you've been seeing that. It's where a lot of times there's connection between a legislator at the state level to another unit of government, a city or county where something's happening and they're trying to get um, contracts there for them that they've helped uh, enable legislation to get the, these kinds of things passed at the state level. And now we're going to work to try to get those contracts uh, uh, you know, uh, on board by a local level of government. Um, that uh, is one thing we think we should prohibit. The city of Chicago has done it. We think we should make that a statewide issue. Um, second item we have on our list is we very much think we should be stopping that legislator lobbying revolving door um, for at least a one year prohibition. Right now, I, a legislature, could be working on a bill that benefits a particular company and I can leave the legislature and immediately go and work for that company. And we've seen that happen. And you can sort of wonder what's really at work when you're doing that piece of legislation when you know, the next day, uh, practically, you could be, be working for, for a company that's benefited by that legislation. Uh, there is prohibitions. We do have some revolving door prohibitions already in place for the executive branch in Illinois, but we don't have any for any of the uh, legislators. And, you know, over half the states uh, in the country do have such a revolving door ban of some sort. Uh, the third item, we think we should better define who a lobbyist is. This is one of the loopholes that we find in the Commonwealth Edison case is that people serve as consultants uh, or attorneys and don't have to register as a lobbyist, but they're in a lot of ways very doing very similar work as a lobbyist. So we can get people that are important to legislators hired in these roles and it doesn't get registered or seen. Um, so we think we need to very much uh, clarify and make a lot more transparent 
who's actually doing those lobbying roles. Um, the second set of reforms have to do with uh, sort of legislative uh, oversight reforms. Um, we right now, legislators have to do some uh, disclosure of their income, uh, but it's very uh, high level. It doesn't give you a whole lot of information. You don't know the extent of what they're really getting from what source. Uh, we think there should be some expansion of that so we can understand what potential conflicts of interest are. Um, and we also, there's ways that we should also be um, making it more clear and a more regularly used process when you do indicate that you have a conflict of interest uh, because of outside income you may have. So that's, we've passed that in the Senate, uh, but this bill has not gotten passed out of the House yet to, to do this kind of an expansion. Second here, we think we, you know, right now the US Congress has ways of censuring um, a colleague if they've done something that's not um, a good practice that does have some sort of a conflict or uh, concern that there may be, we don't have such a process in the state of Illinois. We think we should have an official censure process that we can be using to censure our colleagues if they've done something that break the ethics codes. Uh, we think we clearly need to strengthen the legislative inspector general office. Um, right now, uh, and there's different ways of doing it. We think we got, we got to at least enable them to self-initiate investigations of any type and that it needs to be an independent agency uh, for both hiring and budget. Right now it's not, it's really part of the legislature. So they have to go through the four leaders to get their budgets passed, which is a little bit, um, you know, the, you know, you're, you're, you, you yourselves are providing oversight to you yourselves. There's not a lot of check and balances going on there right now. It's just not independent enough. And right now, direct employees of, of me and every other legislature are exempt from the state's human rights act. So when we saw some of these concerns about sexual harassment, you can't go and use the, the employee who may have that concern, can't go and bring a, 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 bring a potential investigation under the Human Rights Act in Illinois. Uh, we think we need to get rid of that exemption. And then the third area of, of reforms that we were suggesting has to do with leadership reforms. We, we do think we need term limits. Um, obviously we have a speaker here who's been the longest speaker of any state in the country in the history of the United States. Um, this it kind of does lead to a natural consolidation of power that's, I think, very problematic. We think there should be term li limits for the speaker and the minority leader in the House and the president minority leader in the Senate. Right now, we've put rules in place to do that in the Senate, but they're just rules. So we could change those at any point. And we've seen that happen before. At one point, uh, one party in one of the chambers did decide to put term limits on, then they decided to stay longer and they just changed the, those. This needs to be done statutorily where it has some real weight. And lastly, um, we think uh, we should have a policy where legislators, if they're under investigation, should be removed as a leader or from a committee chair uh, during that course of the investigation. If they're found innocent, they can of course get reinstated. And this isn't taking them out of their role as an elected senator or representative, just out of their leadership roles. Um, so, which I think uh, provides um, co confidence around not getting skirting issues of you know, innocent until proven guilty. Some of the things that are not on this list, I just wanna make mention of and, and why, because we discussed all of these items, uh, redistricting reform. Uh, I do think that's something that's highly important in um, sort of the ethics and how well our government can work and the kind of trust you can have in it. I do not believe politicians should be creating their own districts by any stretch of the imagination. I really think there should be an independent commission. I myself have sponsored such legislation. Um, yet, I don't think that is something that, uh, you know, it's a little different. It has to, it, it, it does have to do with some overall power in it, but it's a little bit off of uh, just sort of how people behave in an ethical kind of a fashion. We're also, we're trying to make sure what we put forth were things that we thought could actually pass both chambers. Um, I don't think redistricting reform can, particularly since we're about to come up on a redistricting year. Next year, we'll be embarking on that. I just don't think that's something that has any chance of getting uh, passed right now uh, through the General Assembly uh, either. But that's certainly something I know I will keep working on that I think is important. A, a second item that's not here, we are not dealing with campaign finance changes. Um, we really were dealing with, once you're in the legislature, what are, what are your ethics? I think there are things that we can do there that also lead and make it easier for the people in power to consolidate their power even further. Um, you know, the way we allow 
our leaders to have additional PACs with higher limits on them just further consolidates power to the legislative leaders. I think we could be looking at changes there. I think we could be looking at potentially changing, you know, at least experimenting with public financing. Um, but these are not things we thought were sort of of the same tone and ilk uh, of the other kind of ethical reforms around legislative behavior. Um, restricting outside employment. Um, this is one that comes up a fair amount, but it's very complicated to do this. Um, the state of New York attempted to do this. They raised the salaries for all their legislators and restrict, said they could not have any other outside em employment. It was thrown out by their Supreme Court. It also sort of changes the tone and the flavor of a legislature where it makes it harder for people to do it. If you don't have, you know, your own independent wealth or other ways of doing things, it might be harder to take a job as a, in the General Assembly that if you have kids that you need to help put through college and things like that. It really sort of changes the nature of who might be able to run for office. So there's a lot more, I think, inherent concern around how this may work when we really do have a citizen legislature uh, in Illinois. That's sort of always been the intent. Um, and then last, uh, we did change, we are suggesting making changes to make the legislative inspector general and commission more independent, but we did not recommend changes on the composition of the ethics commission, which as I said, is only made up of legislators, two from each of the four caucuses, the Republicans and the Democrats in each chamber. I think that composition should change, but it's very hard to get an agreement on how to do it um, and what's the right way of doing it. Um, we didn't know that we could ever get anything passed in that regard. So again, we were going back to putting forward a set of um, recommendations that we think should all happen, will really make a big difference in the way Springfield operates and could also be passed. So those are the reasons we don't have these things on. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen as I start talking now about next steps to just say, you know, um, our hope had been that we might try, you know, we, we, we should be expecting to get the report out of the Joint Commission on ethics reform. We haven't seen that. Uh, I would certainly expect that we need to see something before veto session, which is next week. So that's getting very short on timing. Um, but we don't even know if we're gonna have a veto session yet. That's very much up in the air. I know our caucus was getting cold about it. We have uh, obviously the number of COVID cases going up. We're continuing to hit record highs, unfortunately, in Illinois. So I think there's some issues about whether or not we're even going to go. Uh, we will only have one chance to pass a, an ethics reform bill, in my view. There'll be one bill that if it's not um, the right set of things, that's gonna be our only chance. So it's certainly my goal is to make sure that what's in it is meaningful and real. Um, and certainly I'm committed, as I know some of my colleagues are, are trying to work with some of the outside um, actors that are have real credibility in this space to ensure that there's an agreement about whether a bill that's put forward is meaningful, real, can help change the culture in Springfield, and is one that we should encourage people putting votes on. Um, as I say, the. If we try to do separate bills, they're never gonna get passed. So we need a omnibus bill in this that's very hard to vote no on, but yet we think we can get it passed. Um, so that's sort of where we are. And I think timing is next time we meet, uh, I think something on ethics is gonna have to be on the agenda. Um, I think it's hard for us to not do that. I think my Senate president is committed to that. I know he's been uh, working with uh, uh, a group of legislators and putting things together on this. Uh, we haven't seen a draft yet, but we're hoping to see that soon. Um, I don't know that the House has been involved in that yet, so we're going to clearly need to be jumping over that hurdle as well. And there's a lot going on in the House right now, which makes me believe it may be hard to do this um, until we know how things settle out there in the next legislature. So while I was hoping we might do this in veto, I'm not convinced it's going to happen then. I think it may be next session that we really get to it. And on that note, I'll stop and would love to answer any questions. Well, great. Well, thank you so much. That was um, awesome. And, and I loved your slides. Is, uh, are those on your website or is there a way that uh, the audience could get those? Uh, sure. Have, I can email them to you so you can to anybody else and I okay. can also put them on heatherstains.com. But I'm happy well, to email them to you right after we're done. That would be great. Um, and you mentioned, yeah, I, I, we did talk to some of the other um, groups, Change Illinois, Reform Illinois. Uh, their concern about a veto session uh, re ethics reform bill was that it would be kind of like a ethics reform light bill. Um, and just 
passing enough to say, hey, we did ethics reform, and then they would, would move on. Um, are you concerned that if something did pass um, in the veto session or early on uh, during the next section, that they would only do a reform light just so they could say we did something and then, then move on? Are you worried about that also? Yes, 100%. I think that is something, and that's why I think, um, you know, we certainly as a group have talked about the fact that um, we want to ensure whatever the bill is, or that we actually think it is meaningful and that there's agreement that it's meaningful by not just us, but also the outside reform group so that we can be working in concert. I think it's, um, as I say, we're only going to have one chance. So if we get on board something that's not meaningful, we're going to miss that opportunity. Um, so I think it's more important to get it right than to just pass something quickly. Um, and so if it's not right, I know I, for one, will not want to support it. Um, and I think it's going to be important for people who've been working on this issue to stand up and say, this doesn't go far enough. Uh, otherwise, we're just going to miss our chance. And, we, and we've seen that happen before. Yeah, definitely. Um, now, many of the reforms that you talked about just seem like common sense. Um, why do you think that you know, the state of Illinois hasn't implemented some of these in the past? <laughs> you know, whenever you get into the details, it gets very complicated and uh, there's many sides to it. I I I'll use one of the specific proposals as an example for this. Um, it, it seems clear that, uh, you know, a legislature should not also lobby another level of government. But, for example, the way the city of Chicago now defines it, we've got lawyers in the General Assembly who, under the way the state of Illinois has defined it right now, lobbying um, the city of Chicago, um, they couldn't just do their jobs about like, you know, if they're a zoning attorney, they do real estate work, helping to get zoning through the, through the planning department. I don't think that's what we mean. So it gets complicated. I, I do think we should not let them lobby aldermen um, for the city of Chicago. But you, the, the definitions and the way you get into the details make it complicated and meaningful to a lot of people very quickly. And it's always easier to say no to something than to say yes to something and get it to work right. Um, that's the nature of the beat. So it gets very complicated very quickly on a lot of these issues. And so it's just easy to back burner them and not get them passed. Yes, and yeah, you know, I have tons of questions, but uh, I, you know, this is for the audience. So uh, we also have fortunately tons of questions for the audience. So I'll turn it over to Bill Bergman, who's gonna be in charge of uh, uh, fill, filling those questions. Sounds good, thank you. Uh, I'm looking forward to it, but I can't, I hope I don't ask my own questions too. We'll see, there's so many to ask. Uh, a good one from Peter Burchard, uh, excellent proposals, he says. If these proposals were in place for the last 30 years, would Illinois' financial condition be any better today? Oh, our financial con condition. You know, the, th the thing I would say, I, I, I certainly think having Consolidation of power the way we do really does. Uh, there's not a lot of accountability, I, I think, for a lot of our and the redistricting reforms too. I think I, I know that's not in that set of proposals. I do think that's one that can make a fundamental difference. I think making sure you don't have the same leaders in place for decades can really change the culture of a place. It just enables it, it, it provides a different culture. I think having a lot more transparency on what legislators outside income is and conflicts of interest may be also um, ensures that uh, folks are voting the interests of their district. Um, and that's always at the forefront. Um, but a lot of our fiscal problems are, are, they're not caused by ethical issues. I mean, they're, they're caused by, you know, not enough, I think, um, uh, not that ethical judgment. There's other political problems with our democracy, in my view, that creates mm. this problem, not ethical issues. And by that, I will say redistricting, I think, is one of those. I think too many of our races, people are concerned about protecting from the left or the right, not from the middle, in the way we do our redistricting. So it does not bring people together to try to form consensus around things. It divides them. And I think that does help uh, enable not making uh, hard decisions. Uh, because you don't have to worry about somebody who's sort of moderate thinking that way coming in uh, against you in a race. You're only worrying about people on the extremes and the way we've been set up, uh, which does not lead towards better problem solving. It takes us away from that. So I do think the redistricting reform is very critical to try to help 
bring a better balance uh, on the way people are actually bringing problem solving skills to bear as opposed to worrying about their own reelection interests. Well, relating to that, you know, we talked about our Data Z website earlier. One of the variables we have in there is a, an index of how intensively gerrymandered states are, the, the legislative districts. You can do things mathematically, to, and in fact, there are rankings out there of gerrymandering, and you can see a clear-cut um, tendency that states that are more intensively gerrymandered tend to be in worse financial condition. And that, that helps to underscore your, your interest in this redistricting reform effort, I think. Here's another question from Peter. I can't resist sharing it because it's a good follow-up. I'd like to hear more about the Senator's thoughts about changing the culture in Springfield. That relates to my question of, you know, how important are formal organizational or legislative efforts in this area relative to simple leadership and, and cultural, um, cha cultural shifts in, in, in appreciating the, the integrity of the public purse. The, yes, the, uh, and you know, just respect for um, different viewpoints and, and how that comes about. I mean, we're unfortunately living in an era right now where um, you don't necessarily feel like listening to the other side is valued. Um, and facts don't matter entirely uh, in public discourse, which I think is hugely problematic. Um, I do. The one thing I would say is that historically Springfield has at least um, been able to work across the aisle. I mean, I know some of my closest colleague friends are Republican, I'm a Democrat, uh, because truly that's who you have to work with a lot. If you wanna get a big piece of legislation passed, I'm always working with a Republican counterpoint on the best ways of negotiating it and managing it to get it through. Um, and I do feel like there's a lot of very good working relationships that way um, that mean a lot. The problem I have seen is, for example, you know, one of my colleagues who was indicted, I don't think it surprised anybody, um, but yet nothing happened to put him in check. Um, yet I don't think anybody was surprised. That's not, there, there's something wrong and broken in a culture when that's the case. Um, rather than having the expectation that we're all keeping each other in check, everyone's sort of leaving everybody alone and well, not my business, don't say anything. I think these are the kinds, I think that's what needs to change um, is the expectation that we're all holding each other to a higher standard, not that we're you know, putting on our blinders and letting everybody be themselves. Uh, there has to be that, um, that, that check. We, we had a question earlier, how long is it taking to get this uh, joint commission report? Where is it? And I, I'd like to follow up with that one who is responsible for that report getting published and where can we go to, to watch them as they continue their work or lack thereof? Well, I don't think they have any more meetings scheduled or any hearings. Those were all public. So anybody could watch those, but I don't think they have any more. I think they're done doing all their public hearings. I think it's left now in drafting the recommendations. Um, as I say, it was supposed to be out on March 31st. It hasn't come. We obviously understood then we're in the height of the pandemic. I don't understand how now in November we haven't seen anything. I, you know, you know, there's um, the there's a number of members on that commission. The co-chairs of it um, are probably the ones who are most clearly working with the staff on what comes forward. Uh, what I think that may indicate is they're not necessarily agreement on the recommendations. That's just um, I, I don't have I don't have a basis of of, of knowledge on that as I'm not on the commission. Uh, but that would be what my concern is, which I think just indicates how challenging it might be to, to get something passed here. Um, so I think we may just need an alternative out there. And I think the Senate is working on something to at least have out there. And I'm, I'm anxiously awaiting that. I think, uh, I think I, I've think i heard a strong commitment from uh, Senate President Harmon that he wants to address the ethics reform. So we're, I'm hoping we're going to see something from them, even if we don't see something from the commission. Well, we'll be watching for that one. I think it's pretty important. Thank you. Uh, we have a, a more of a technical question. First, let's start with the, could you talk briefly about that Illinois Legislative Inspector General position? What, what, where is that person? Who is that person? And what role do they play? Why is that an important, why is that important job? So the Inspector General, um, it is created in statute, but um, it is the four leaders who, um, it, it's ultimately the commission that hires. Uh, and the commission is made up of eight legislators. So it is they're hiring their own inspector general, which isn't atypical 
Uh, usually it's one of the four leaders that makes recommendations on people for them to um, consider. Uh, we've always had outside counsel doing it, you know, ha have hired somebody in an outside law firm. So it hasn't been a full-time job uh, and its own independent budget and hiring ability, um, which is one of the reasons we're recommending that. Um, I do think that we might want to change the composition of the commission. So instead of having just those eight legislatures, it could be somebody who's not a legislature. I will say Senate President Harmon's taken a first step in doing that. When he's just made a, his second appointment, um, one of my colleagues, Senator Pat McGuire, but Pat McGuire is retiring, so he will no longer be a senator, but he will stay on the Legislative Ethics in, uh, Commission. The way it works is there, each of the four leaders can appoint two people to it. They've historically each just appointed people in their caucuses, um, but that doesn't have to be the case. So at least we will have somebody going forward who is not um, in, in one of the caucuses. But I do think we need to make that more independent. The other issue we have with the inspector uh, general right now, as they have expressed, is they can't always initiate investigations. Some, you know, they have to go to the commission members and get the okay to start an investigation. So that's clearly an issue. Um, and th there have been times when issuing a report has been blocked by the commission, but they're not allowed to just put out a report once they've done a finding, finish their investigation. They have to get approval by the commission to issue it. Um, and that's not always been the case. So they have some reports that have never been published, uh, which I think should also you know, be of concern. There should be ways of managing that and making that independent. Okay, here's a, here's a question that's looking like it's a little more uh, technical and lengthy, but let's try to hear it out. One common theme from your presentation is that reforms and other items often die in the other chamber, typically in the House Rules Committee. Oh, so she smiles. Good. You're up on this one. <laughs> changing, changing, changing the process of bill progression to mirror the more democratic process in the Senate would require the House Speaker to allow a bill that would remove a major lever of power in his toolkit. How would this ever happen? or should it? <laughs> well, when we change the rules in the Senate um, to make it easier to, or that, that now there's no bill that gets stuck in the Rules Committee in the Senate, everything gets assigned out. So at least it gets a hearing. Um, that happened when we were having a new Senate president come. This, well, this was done when it was uh, John Cullerton being elected. I think the times that those kinds of sort of fundamental changes to rules happen is at a time of leadership change. So, you know, I think the easiest time for that's going to be when there is a new, uh, if there, if um, there is going to be a new speaker in the house, that will be a time to probably have some changes uh, in the way that they are um, structuring the rules. Um, realistically, that's, that's what I would suspect to be the case. I have a related question to rulemaking I can't resist bringing up now. The other day I took a look at the Illinois Municipal Code, the actual, the entire act. And if you start scrolling down, if you start scrolling down on that page, it's it, it would take days to get down to the bottom of the act. And my question is, is our environment, our legal environment in Illinois so um, minutely overdefined by law? Is that part of the problem leading to the need to manipulate law for, for special interest groups to, to, to get ahead? Uh, is our is our legal environment just too uh, too overbearing in Illinois? Uh, that is a great question and I don't really feel like I have a good answer to. Um, I do feel like there's something to the question because if you're trying to, uh, if you just can say you're always abiding by the law no matter how minute, but you know in the big scheme maybe that doesn't lead to the right, what your intent is, that can very much happen obviously. And I, I think it's really hard to legislate ethics. I mean good behavior, you know what's right and wrong. I mean you actually you have to have some fundamentals but it's really hard to legislate ethical behavior. It really does have to be a culture that that's the expectation of pe how people are holding themselves to that kind of an, an, an ideal. So certainly I agree with the spirit of that. I just don't feel like I have enough. Yeah, know. in addition to become, you know, that coming from the, the culture coming from the leadership, um, I think also it needs to come from, uh, take the lead from the voters and the voters need to, you know, consider ethics when they're voting on somebody. Very good point. And you know, a lot of these things, one of the things that I have found to be very effective in different areas, and I, and I really think the um, sort of good government ethics groups might consider this. We, we've, I've seen this happen in the area of choice with personal PAC. I've seen this happen in the area of environmental groups where they come together um, and have 
they have a very strong process of identifying before somebody's elected, here are the things we care about, fill out your questionnaires, where do you stand on these things? And then you actually hold folks accountable for those things at the back end um, and do report cards. And if you, ha if you have enough of a, a, a following and good list, you can then let folks know, did they actually do what they said they were gonna do? Better yet then is when you actually have dollars that then follow that so that you're helping to keep in place the people who really are doing what they said they were going to and is important. Or if somebody's not, try to find a candidate to run against them that is. Um, we don't have that kind of accountability around these issues of good governance um, in the same way. Um, I think there's some groups now that are out there that hopefully can be coming together and creating this kind of environment. But it does, uh, concerted efforts along those lines I have seen really make a difference. There's a question about a recent column. One of our friends is Madeline Dubeck. Her, um, she had a column in Cranes on, on reform in Springfield and apparently uh, had made a, a comment that the former acting legislative inspector general testified that the Le Legislative Ethics Commission wasn't publishing her work. Was that something you're aware of or did you, did you yes. know about it? And that is one of the things I mentioned that right, right now, um, not, they're, they're, they're not independent, that they can't initiate an investigation on their own and they can't issue a report without the ethics commission saying it's okay. Those are two things that they need to be able to ha have that ability. We have a, we have a, a good question from a, an active participant in Illinois, Darlene Singer um, calling, Heather, great work, thank you. I uh, was going to ask the same question. Hey, <laughs> uh, do you have any best Darlene. practices? Do you have any best practices from other states? Is there any formal effort to go out and look for good lessons? I mean, that's, that's one of our themes at, at Truth and Accounting. All states are not alike, and there are some really good actors out there. What, what's, what, what sort of lessons can we learn from other states in this area? Yep, absolutely. You know, and we did, um, in, in doing our work around putting this together, uh, we uh, Reform for Illinois went and did a lot of surveying work for us in other states. Uh, we had some interns ourselves doing it through NCSL, the National Conference of State Legislatures, comparing what other states do. And everything we're suggesting here is in line with um, much more what other states do, uh, particularly in the areas of revolving door bans, um, areas of doing things like having censures, um, uh, making sure that you can't lobby other levels of government, um, term limits, that's not an ATEP a typical one, at least for the leaders. The one area that, um, and that's why we had considered putting it in was some sort of a more limitation on outside income, but no other states have done that. And it is very complicated to do that. So I know some groups here have been looking for that. We haven't found good examples of that. The one state that had tried it had not succeeded in getting it done. Um, so yeah, there's a, a lot of other states do a better job on this. But as I say, I think a lot of it really is cultural, um, that it, it's hard to just, uh, get it all right by the things you put down in the law. Well, what can we do culturally? What do you, you know, what would you suggest to inspire and just getting people inspired in this area? Well, how would yeah. you fix this? I, you know, well, I, I think you've got, um, I, I think that the trust issue is huge. Um, I think having um, uh, transparency is a real way of going. And I, I really do think having um, the, the good government organizations out there working together on um, how, is there some sort of a report card we can do on how folks are doing in this regard? Maybe one way of really uh, providing some accountability on these kinds of issues. Um, certainly having regular, uh, you know, we do a lot of work on state budgets. Um, where are we in terms of um, making needed reforms uh, and uh, running the government well on these kinds of items? Uh, we should have a regular accounting of that, that is publicly, that publicly matters. But you gotta have a public, these things can get so esoteric that it's, it's sometimes hard to have the public's attention on it. Um, I think Illinois, because we have such lack of trust in government, there may be more of an opportunity on that than in other states, um, because there is a concern. Um, and I do think we're gonna, as I say, have a moment of time to do one bill, and I'm very much hoping that um, we can together be working on something that is meaningful. Well, yeah, thanks for, yeah. go, go ahead, Sheila. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Uh, yeah, and you know, I, I've heard that, you know, in order to get change, people need to trust the change agents. And we seem to, you know, not have that trust. So it's very difficult to get change if you're not trusting the people who are trying to bring about change. That's why I think you've got to work with the outside credible groups. 
I think you can't do it without them and they should be holding out. They should be working in unison. I think that's really important. They should work together. One of the things that we've seen, for example, when I first got into the state uh, Senate, environmental groups were in different places on, on, on the same bill. You would have you know, the big name environmental groups not agreeing which means any legislature can vote however they want and say they were being with the environmentalists <laughs> right. um, and did. So they started changing that and they did get their report cards. And you know, it's so it's, it, it has changed the way that works. I think that government groups should be working together, developing their agenda and making sure that they know where people stand on those things and are communicating it and whatever mechanism. And I think we do have to have those outside credible parties um, to have the public have any faith that what we're doing is meaningful and significant, unfortunately, um, because I think that trust is so low. Here's a I'm question. writing this down. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a question relating to uh, the practical uh, implications of the loss of trust that we're talking about. Um, it's a targeted one on a, a rather pointed issue, but it's an interesting question from Jane Balangi. The fair tax failure hinged a lot on the lack of ethics. Too often we were told, why should we trust them, and especially Madigan? That's from uh, a, a person that looks like from the League of Women Voters. Is that you know fair taxes? You know whether it's good or bad is another question. But what's the what's the implication of what she's blaming for the for the failure? No, I think that's absolutely correct. People don't trust government. They don't want to do something that has the appearance of giving them the ability to tax differently, to have more money to spend when we just have an inherent lack of trust in in government. I think that's absolutely at the heart of why uh, that failed. I, I, I do. I wholly agree with that. And Another you know, and I, that's why I really do. I think it's fundamental to the state right now is that we have to build up our trust and credibility in government. Do you think there's room for a new citizens group dedicated to ethics reform? Is that you know, granted, well, there's we have some out there. I think they should yeah. work together, and you know, hopefully okay. they can become a more powerful force. I think that's. It's, um, this is not a, an issue that voters vote on right now, but they also wouldn't know how to vote on it. Um, so that goes, sort of goes hand in hand. But I, I do think it's easy for people to, you know, I, I'll give you a specific example. I, when we were trying to pass a bill, this is going back a few years, that would just require the budget to be available and online four days in advance of voting on it. And literally in caucus, we had a member say that, well, then I know what's in it and I couldn't vote on it. We can't pass this bill. Now, that's sort of an insane thought. And, but nobody in his district would know that these are the kinds of ways that he or she's voting. Like you do need some accountability out there on how people are you know, actually presenting themselves. Um, there's just, you don't have that right now. I don't think voters know what they're voting on in terms of how somebody behaves. Um, and are they doing the, you know, the right things? Are they, 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 are they being transparent in the way they do their business? Are they indicating if they have a conflict? All these kinds of things. Are they voting for things that really will uh, improve the culture or not? We just don't have that right now. And it's not things that voters vote on because they don't know. Um, and that, that lack of knowledge isn't, that lack of knowledge isn't necessarily, you know, bad or irrational. In fact, the, an individual person has to do so much work to try to understand the issues. That's where the, that's where the importance of the intermediaries that you're talking about and or the leadership in, 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 the, in, the, in the legislature and the governor's mansion are, is so important, including in our, our cities, not just our state. Okay, here's a, here's a more targeted question relating to uh, practices in other states versus Illinois. Uh, are term limits possible or are they being considered? And, you know. Well, so the term limits, they, I mean, I, I can't remember the number of states, but a number of states have term limits, a number don't. That's one that, uh, and we debated that mightily within our group. And we, we decided term limits on leaders are what we thought was really important and critical around how the place operates um, and that consolidation of power that we've seen that I think is really problematic. Um, Term limits overall on legislators, I don't, I think those can sometimes um, work backwards. Th this is just Heather speaking now. And we actually saw that when, you may remember the name Patrick Collins, when Quinn came in after Bogoyevich, he had, you know, that uh, prosecutor come in and do a whole ethics review. They did not support term limits in that group. 
for the same reason that I came to, because it gives a lot more power to staff and outside lobbyists who are there long-term potentially than the legislators who are supposedly representing the interests. They don't always work, I think, in the way they're intended to work. Um, but I do think having that consolidated power in few hands for a long period of time is hugely problematic. So that's you're, why you're, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. Sometimes it's sometimes. and there's other other things are are more important. Oh, Here's it's, it's, in terms of our our ability to know who we you know what do we know and when do we know it. The importance of the fourth estate in communicating to the citizens is so important. We've got a good question from a responsible member of that fourth estate with us, Cole Lauterbach. Um, quote, admittedly a little self-serving, but <laughs> Cole says, Illinois is one of the few states where lawmakers are entirely immune to open records requests, FOIA requests. He says, I I've been told the ability to see lawmaker emails would chill the deliberative process. If that were true, how do other states manage to do this? How do they manage to operate? You know, that is a great question. I, I, I assumed, and this is just a bad assumption on my part then maybe, because I don't know the answer to this, that that was common across, because uh, I think the federal government, they're not subject to it. So that had been, I did not think other states were. So I just don't have that data point. So that is something I would very much like to actually understand more about and follow up with you on. So please reach out. <laughs> I'd like to learn more about that one. Okay. Here's I, I thought that was standard operating procedure for legislators. Uh, it maybe we, you know, that that's an interesting, you know, that's another one of those fixes that may not be a fix because you move the information into other places that are hard to find. It's... Yeah, I just don't know. I, I need to learn more about that one. Okay. Here's a question. Hello, Heather. Is uh, the Illinois or the country's financial condition, does it depend on party change or environmental change or, or leadership change? Or does it depend on systems of leadership? Kind of, I guess, a, kind of a broadly framed question. But you know, I, I, the, what our topic today, Heather, is, is, I believe, integrally related to the, you know, the, the condition of the finances for, for Illinois and the, the, the ethics environment, are, are part and parcel of what we face as citizens. Our, our legislators and our government have, unfortunately, um, treated the public purse as something that's more of a private vehicle for special interest groups as opposed to the, the long-term common interest that we have and in the integrity of the public purse. And we, we see that in the financial condition of the state and the city of Chicago now. The, the hole that they've dug is, is so massive. It's going to take time and it's going to take trust to get out of it. Um, where, do you, where do you see, where, where do we go going down, down the road to address this? Well, issue. you know, on uh, the, 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 the silver lining, uh, you know, I, I, I'm somebody who supported the fair tax. I think that's better um, policy to have a different tax rates for people who can afford a higher rate. Um, that said, um, I think there's an opportunity now with it not passing, to, we're going to have to go back to the drawing board. Um, that did not pass. Um, and so we're going to have to go about new and different solutions. Um, I think we will, um, you know, I, and I think what, you know, I think obviously a lack of, lack of trust was part of that not passing. I also think the fact that it was not seen as to how it was going to solve our problems was part of the problem. You know, I think we need, and they exist. I mean, I was a part of um, a bipartisan group working on ways that we thought we could actually make some significant change to really resolve a lot of our problems in Illinois. And you, there are paths out. Um, it's everybody does have to be willing to give something. Um, I think that's possible. I think you just need to get some of the parties, including labor at the table and willing to sit down and ne negotiate on how can we make this um, uh, financial situ situation work for everybody in the state of Illinois. I think you need to bring people to the table and have open conversation about it. Um, and you know, with the fair tax not passing, maybe that opportunity is now gonna present itself. Could we go back to the nitty gritty of some of your proposals? I was intrigued by the, the idea of defining a lobbyist. How do you define lobbying activity practically when it can include so many different formal and informal forms of lobbying? How do you define a lobbyist for the, for the purpose of ethics reform? Uh, well, you know, well, it's obviously trying to impact a piece of um, you know, legislation that's gonna get passed at some level of government, be it an ordinance, um, whatever it is at that, uh, the, the, the laws that rule that level of government. Um, 
So we were trying to define it as anything that is trying to, uh, although you know we were putting out proposals, it's not uh, actually writing out legislation, which is a very different thing and where it always gets very complicated in how you define it in the details. That's just always the case. Um, but we do think it needs to be, be focused there, not focused on doing something that's sort of more administrative in nature um, that really can preclude citizen legislators from doing what might be their day job as well and being able to represent folks. There is a line there. And until we make a decision in Illinois that we want just full-time legislators, which I don't think is where people are right now, we need to enable people to um, have their jobs, um, earn their livings, represent their constituents' interests, but not lobby other levels of government. And how you actually get into the definitions of that then does get complicated. I don't know. Hopefully that answered the question. No, that was, it was just, it, you know, I, I think practically it's it's so hard to define what is or isn't it lobbying is. that it's it's a challenge. And again, the, the importance of cultural versus legal fixes and, and leadership. So that's one reason we're really happy to have you here, Heather. This is, you know, having you as a leader in this area is something that Illinois needs. So thanks, thanks for your work. Here's a question. The Civic Federation has recommended that Springfield take the necessary steps to allow the General Assembly to legislate remotely, especially critical in the current environment. Are you hopeful the General Assembly will consider this? Well, I'm hopeful, but I don't think it will happen. Um, I think we might be able to pass it in the Senate. I don't think the House would pass it at this moment. Um, and I think we should. Um, that all said, obviously, you know, the, the greater good will be that it's no longer necessary in this moment of time. Um, certainly the news of vaccines getting developed. You know, I was on a call earlier today with Dr. Awadi from the city of Chicago, um, who is feeling very hopeful that we will actually have, it was really nice to get very hopeful news, that we will have something approved by the end of the, the year um, with early next year, vaccines starting to go out to, you know, first responders and healthcare workers and hopefully by spring or next summer, more broadly uh, available. So hopefully this will not be much longer that we're operating in this environment. But I would fully vote for that bill. I think we should be able to do it remotely in this environment. So Bill, um, I have to uh, thank you for asking the questions. I have to, we're gonna have to wrap it up. Um, you know, thank the, the Senator, Senator Heather Staines for joining us. Um, if you want her slides, uh, reach out to us. Um, or I think you said they'd be on heatherstains.com. Uh, .com. Um, and um, I, you know, obviously thank the audience for attending. All your questions were great. And as I said, if you didn't get one in, uh, feel free to reach out to us afterwards. Um, go to our website, so truthandaccounting.org or data-z.org for more information about our organization. And uh, the Union League Club, I'm the chair of the state and local government subcommittee there. Um, so we are working with the other ethics uh, reform groups and uh, hopefully we'll, uh, oh, I'm, I'm ready to then take to them uh, some of those great suggestions that you had, Heather, um, Senator Staines. And uh, thanks everybody again for joining. And uh, um, we'll uh, see you in December for another uh, Ask the Experts. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Heather. Looking forward to learning more about your work. Thanks for having me. And I got your uh, link, Cole. Thanks for sending me out.